Um, welcome to this session and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, please feel to introduce yourself in the chat, um, the organization you work for, your location, and your connection with circular agri business. We're expecting an interactive session, so please we ask for the full attention. This session is on making food, making the most of food, scaling circular agri business in Africa. And uh, just as a brief introduction, I'm called Peter Bimaro. I work with Bob Inc. based in Nairobi. And I'll be presenting this session together with my counterpart, Eric Obura, uh, working with Vyokup. For those who are not familiar with Bob Inc., Bob Inc. is a foundation based out of the Netherlands, with two offices in Kenya and Bangladesh, and 40 colleagues in other markets in Africa and Asia. We believe the best products should be made available where they matter most. And from startups to multinationals, we help organizations to design and deliver inclusive, commercially viable business models. At this point, I'd like to request Eric to introduce himself and uh, just shed the light about village capital. Eric, over to you. Thank you, Peter. I'm really excited to be here. So uh, Village Capital has been active globally since 2009 and has supported more than 1,200 1, entrepreneurs around the world who have gone on to raise more than $4 billion in following investment. So we have been present in Sub-Saharan Africa since 2012 and have developed a curated network of entrepreneurs, investors, and many other experts in the region. So. We have also to date supported more than 120 startups uh, in various sectors, and these include agriculture, fintech, and the future of work. And additionally, um, so as part of our ecosystem building work, we run accelerators for entrepreneurial support organizations, uh, ESOs, and we enable them to raise funding and run programs that effectively support entrepreneurs across the continent. So I'm really excited to be here and share more about what we have been doing uh, with the OFOMS program. And would like to invite Peter to uh, carry us on. Yeah, over to you, Peter. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric, for that introduction. So OFOMS is an accelerator program being implemented in Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda. Uh, this program is funded by IKEA Foundation. The IKEA Foundation focuses on creating brighter lives on a livable planet through philanthropy and grant making. Bob Inc. and Village Capital are implementing partners of OFAMS. And now that you know ourselves, myself and Eric, I think it's important to know who we have in the audience. And uh, a poll is going to be run by my colleague, Shireen. So we'd like to know who you are and which categories you fall in. Are you a donor? Are you an entrepreneur? Are you a value chain actor? Do you belong to a consumer association? So the poll is open. We'd like to know who you are. Thank you. Yes, I see the answers coming in. Thank you, Shireen. If you could do the honors of letting us know what it looks like in terms of the responses. Yes, <clears throat> I will give everyone a few more seconds to answer. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. share it with you ah super i think we have almost cost to a balanced representation uh, we have a few donors a few knowledge institutions uh enterprise support organizations and also uh network providers fantastic so moving on in terms of the session objectives um this session will be introducing to you offums um offums aims to make circularity a mainstream approach in the east african agri food sector by 2025 uh, with SMEs being capacitated to drive transition from a linear to circular food systems. We can only realize this vision together. Um, therefore, let's exchange ideas on what each stakeholder can contribute towards this realization. Um, in terms of the agenda, the agenda will have about five areas of, of conversation with you. The first one is framing the challenge, and then we'll introduce you to our firms and give you a bit of more detail around what we want to do and what we want to focus on. And then we shall explore business opportunities from the ESO perspective. And then under ideation, we shall break out into three groups, um, into Kenya, Ethiopia, and Uganda. And these groups will be based on your preferences that have been pre-exposed uh, to us. And then we shall wrap up with a summary and the next steps. So in terms of framing the challenge, we have quick quizzes that we'd like to run by you, just to, just to give you some bit of energy in terms of what we're trying to do here. So in 2021, East Africa has a population of about 600 and 400, 466 million inhabitants. And uh, what do you think will be the estimated population in East Africa by 2050? This is a poll. Is it A, 651 million, 687 million, 
692 million or 830 million. Sharin? Yes, I see the answers coming in. Super. All right, I'm going to end the poll. Thank you all for answering. Great. <laughs> Interesting. Um, most of you are actually right. The answer is 830 million people. And that is what we project to be the population in East Africa by 2050. And this means the food demand will nearly double with the doubling of the population in East Africa. We have another question to you. And this is about food losses. So what percentage of fruits and vegetables spoil before they can be consumed in Africa? Is it A, 20, 10 to 20%, B, 20 to 30%, C, 30 to 40%, or D, 40 to 50%? Shari? Yes, answers are coming in. Super. All right. Thank you all for answering. Going to close it again. Okay. Wow. <laughs> what an audience. You're all right. Majority of you are right. 48% are right. Indeed, 40 to 50% of the food losses are actually happening in, in, uh, in the food sector in Africa. And by the way, did you know that 80% of food losses in Africa occur at on farm at gene processing? It's a known fact, and these are statistics that are being shared by FAO. So it's nice to know this, these numbers. So why will we be expecting the food demand to double in 2050? We're now spoiling up to 50% of our food. So we have a big challenge ahead of us. And the question is, how will we sustainably feed a growing population without depleting the natural, the plant's natural resources? And then the second one, while at the same time, agriculture value chains generate many products and byproducts that are often left wasted. So those are the big challenges that we're currently facing in East Africa and Africa generally as a, as a concern. And moving forward, um, from smallholder farmers across the entire value chain, from smallholder farmers to the BOP consumers, food travels across the entire value chain from harvesting to quality control, processing and retail. A lot of food gets wasted along the value chain. Think about byproducts such as cashew apple and the cashew nut, and also the orange leftover pills. You will always have byproducts in value chains, and these are all basically described as unavoidable losses. You also have avoidable food losses, such as rejected fruits uh, like tomatoes and milk that spoils before reaching the market. And all these provide opportunities for us to valorize into new products. So the challenge to us is how do we make the most of these food losses? Um, we have another quiz to you, just to ensure that at least we get you psyched about what we're trying to do. And this is regarding um, the orange pills. So the question to you is, what kind of products can be banned from the orange pills? A, animal feed, B, fertilizer, C, lemonade, D, energy, or all the above? Sure. Yes, I'm seeing that one answer option is not in the poll, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to close the poll again. Okay. Fantastic. 93% of all responses are correct. Indeed, all the above products can be made from orange leftover pills. And interestingly, in the Netherlands, there's a Dutch company called Pill Pioneer. Now, Peel Pioneer is one of those classic circular businesses that is making the most of orange peels. They're currently making animal feed, oils, detergent, powders from, orange, from the orange leaf of peels. So it's a classic example of how they're viralizing these products to ensure that nothing is lost and, and uh, value is maximized. Um, at all farms, in terms of the circular business models that we want to work towards and promote, um, at all farms, we're looking at SMEs that are basically working on circular business. And to prioritize where we see value uh, coming in at the highest level, we're following a hierarchy of using food losses and agriculture byproducts, with the highest being human food, um, basically looking at how we can convert food losses and agriculture byproducts into human food, for example, turning rejected tomatoes into ketchup. The next level of viralization is animal feed, where we're looking at converting orange peels, for example, into new ingredients for animal fodder, and then food packaging. Uh, and a classic example is using pineapple, uh, pineapple crowns into biodegradable uh, packaging materials. 
and then soil enhancements, and lastly into bioenergy. So converting into, for example, biogas uh, to run our culture machinery, uh, or producing briquettes uh, for the oil income market uh, consumers to cook their meals. Uh, moving forward, um, at this point, we'd like to share with you just a few classic uh, examples of companies that we have come across in East Africa that are demonstrating some bit of circularity. And to show you these examples, to ensure level playing field, we have chosen companies that are not likely to participate in our, in our accelerator program. And we think this will be you know, a, good, a good example of what is out there in East Africa. Um, so starting with Kenya, with the ketchup project in Kenya, did you know that in tomatoes in Kenya, it is estimated that an average of 40% are left sold or thrown away in terms of rejects. And to overcome this challenge, um, the ketchup project, which is a Dutch social enterprise, started sun drying tomatoes on site. And once these tomatoes are dried, they are processed and sold as ketchup. And already they penetrated the, the Dutch markets and uh, they're already uh, maximizing value from rejected tomatoes. Another example is uh, in Ethiopia that we're looking at is uh, Galani coffee. So Ethiopia, for those who don't know, Ethiopia is one of Africa's top producers of coffee. When processing coffee through drying and dehusking, considerable streams of byproducts are generated. Galani coffee in Ethiopia uses dried coffee sherries uh, to make completely new products called kaskara, kaskara, just to pronounce it right, is kaskara. Um, this is a unique tea-like infusion. And interesting, the demand for this product in the local high-end markets is growing tremendously. The third example that we'd like to share with you of the classic circular business in, in Kenya is called Insectipro. So Insectipro is supplying agribusinesses in Kenya with black soldier flies to make animal feeds and fertilizer. Uh, the black soldier fly converts organic waste into high value protein. And uh, this protein rich animal feed from the black soldier fly larvae is healthier, generates higher yields and uses less environmental resources than the alternatives. At this stage, I'd like to invite Eric Obura uh, to just take us through an introduction of Ofarms and dig a dip deeper into what Ofarms is all about and what we want to achieve. Eric, over to you. Ah, thank you so much, Peter, for that excellent overview and uh, some of the principles around circularity. And this is very central to the Ofarms program. So I'll be taking us deeper into Ofarms and at this point, I am really excited to announce that uh, All Farms is the first African SME accelerator completely focused uh, on circular agribusiness. So it's really a pioneering program and that you're very excited about. But before I share further details, um, I would like to reiterate, I think as mentioned earlier, that All Farms is funded by the IKEA Foundation and Bob Inc. and Village Capital are the implementing partners. Okay, so carrying on. <clears throat> so OFAMS is a multi-year program. Um, it's going to run from 2021 uh, up until 2023. And uh, the program generally has three key defining pillars. So starting with the first pillar, we shall be accelerating 40 innovative circular agribusinesses uh, in Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia. And these shall be working through ESOs. Uh, so these are, as I alluded to earlier, these are entrepreneurial support organizations. And we have partner ESOs that um, shall be uh, running the accelerators. And that feeds nicely into our second pillar. So, so we, uh, the second pillar is about capacity building training uh, for these ESOs. And so um, I'm really excited to announce that we have actually had this phase and uh, Later on in, uh, in the presentation, you're going to have an opportunity to have uh, meet these ESOs and have a feel of the work they do and also share deeply about uh, some of the uh, work we've covered uh, in regards to the accelerators. And so, um, so our vision is generally to make circular agribusiness uh, a mainstream approach. And so uh, the third pillar involves you know, wider dissemination of our learnings uh, to SMEs, uh, accelerators, and general key stakeholders uh, across the ecosystem. So we've been able to carry out uh, at the beginning of the program, uh, a landscaping study uh, in Ethiopia and Kenya. And uh, so this was really for us to get a deeper understanding uh, of the different country contexts and the ecosystems. So carrying on, um, yeah, I think it's important for us to get a key understanding of you know, what is OFAMS actually targeting. Peter has alluded to that uh, earlier on, 
but I just want to go deeper into it. So uh, just an overview. So food losses uh, and waste, uh, they're predominant in African food systems. I think this one we know, and some solutions have been developed to avoid this. But there is, however, a key distinction between avoidable losses and unavoidable losses. So I'll start with the avoidable losses. And um, traditionally, uh, post-harvest loss programs have targeted these avoidable losses. So just some examples for uh, you know, our remembrance of this is, so rejected fresh produce uh, like tomatoes. So this can be something that's considered low grade or uh, fresh produce that you know, spoils before reaching the market, probably because of long transit uh, times. So these are some really good examples. And generally uh, solutions have been provided to some of these. For example, cold chain storage to basically increase the shelf life. And now going over to the unavoidable losses. So the OFARMS program, just to be specific, is targeting these unavoidable food losses. So key examples can include um, byproducts from crop cultivation, such as maize stocks. So as we all know, it's the, uh, the maize uh, seeds on the cob that are really important, but the cob is wasted. Uh, the maize stems are wasted, you know, leaves from cassava plants, um, or even byproducts of food processing, such as whey from cheese uh, or rice bran. So these are really unavoidable, and uh, many times uh, they are they are left to waste be, uh, because uh, because of var various reasons. And this can include that then make business sense uh, the the possible financial value from utilizing them historically has been lower than the cost uh, that would be attached to that. So most times it's really left to waste. So um, we are looking at businesses that are reusing some of these unavoidable losses or wastes, uh, you know, through innovative circular business solutions. So that's really uh, the, the high target of all farms. And Peter spoke to an extent about this. And so um, just carrying on. Um, yeah, so, a key question, you know, um, why all farms in East Africa? You know, um, Africa really has so many other regions, but uh, this is why, and for us, why we felt, so we felt there's a very strong need uh, for circular agri-food systems in East Africa, as the population has been growing at a really rapid rate, and uh, between 2013 and 2017, uh, a growth rate of 6.7% was recorded, and that's really much higher than any other growth rate globally. So this in turn directly increases the demand for food. And additionally, uh, despite you know, the excellent weather, the fertile land that's been associated with East Africa, uh, climate change effects, you know, as seen across the regions, this is disrupting seasons, uh, rain seasons and the like. So uh, in as such, the food systems are disrupted. So in as much as the natural prevailing conditions are favorable, uh, you find that uh, at times the, the harvests are really low because uh, there's really low mechanization or modernization of the agricultural food system. So that also creates pressure in addition to the increasing population. And another key aspect is that the East Africa circular ecosystem is really, really nascent. Uh, it's largely in infancy. And this creates strong business opportunities uh, multi-year. And so um, to summing it up, you know, the addition of high food losses high growing population, uh, you know, East Africa presents a very strong case for testing the OFAMS approach. And once we're able to test the learnings, uh, as I shared earlier in our third key pillar, uh, we shall be able to have a, a very solid model that can be replicated uh, in other regions across the continent and even globally where relevant, yeah. So carrying on. So where are we now? And I think that's a very important question to ask ourselves. Um, as I said, it's a multi-year program, so how far have we come along? So we started, as I said, with a, a landscaping study, and that really gave us a deep understanding and, a deep under, and exposure to some of the businesses actually in the ecosystem that uh, Peter spoke of earlier. And so uh, at the moment, um, we are launching accelerators, so we are really excited to announce that Kenya uh, has launched the accelerator, and um, Isabella, uh, from e for impact in Kenya shall be uh, speaking a lot more to that and the traction they've gotten. And uh, starting next year in January, we shall launch the accelerator in Uganda 
and the accelerator in Ethiopia. And generally across the entire program duration, we shall be gathering a rich volume of um, learnings, insights, data that we shall be sharing and uh, through workshops, but then also through reports uh, throughout the program. So um, carrying on, so, so that was it really to an extent, a brief introduction about all farms. And at this point, I uh, would really like to uh, ideate and think about uh, some business opportunities from you know, the ESO's perspective. So the ESO's uh, are the organizations that are directly with their hands on the pulse uh, on all farms, and they have key uh, local insights that they can share um, in regards to, to the program. So, so carrying on, yeah, I'm really excited um, to, to share about the organizations that are at the front front line uh, for the OFAMS program. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to invite uh, Barbara Bezawit and Isabella in that order to uh, introduce the organizations, introduce themselves, and Isabella will take us deeper into the activities Info Impact has done uh, in OFAMS uh, to date uh, about the accelerator. So uh, Barbara, uh, over to you to really uh, speak much more around uh, the activities of Hypo Lab in Uganda. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, my name is Barbara Lorenz Tarazi. I'm a co founder and managing director for Hive Collab. Hive Collab is Uganda's first technology uh, and incubation hub. We started out in 2010, and our goal is to scale ideas with positive social impact. We support uh, businesses that are leveraging technology. Um, in agriculture, education, health, finance, and governance. And we work with a whole ecosystem. We work with um, academia, we work with private sector, we work with government and civil society to see that we support young people build innovations that are scaling Uganda's digital economy. And I'm very excited to be partnering with Village Capital and Bob Inc. on this uh, project. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Barbara. Um, Based on it, uh, kindly introduce yourself and next up. In the next up, Addis, uh, which is a social enterprise based here in Addis, uh, it is uh, actually part of uh, the Center for African Leadership uh, Strategic Cults in, in, in acronym. And it has been around since 2014. So basically what the incubation hub or the accelerator programs are being run by this initiative in Addis is uh, focusing on leadership, entrepreneurship, business advisory services on agribusiness, agri-technology, uh, fintech, health sector, and uh, once in a while something innovative, uh, focusing on uh, technical, technological like machineries and all. But our key strategic advantage, uh, strength is uh, agribusiness. Agri We're also very happy to be part of this uh, first cohort, which would uh, be the first in East Africa to focus on circular agribusinesses because it would also give us an opportunity to build on our existing skills, which have been developing for the past uh, six, seven years on young, fresh university graduates. Most of them, most of the mentees are university graduates and uh, young professionals. So it would give an opportunity for us to build on that. And thank you for the opportunity. Back to you, Eric. Thank you so much, Beza. And we're also really excited to have have a uh, part of the program. So um, I'd like to invite Isabella to introduce EFO Impact and she'll further share about uh, the attraction they have had with the accelerator in Kenya. Over to Isabella. Thanks, Eric. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to be part of this program. So my name is Isabella Tanai. I work at E4 Impact Foundation and uh, particularly at the E4 Impact Accelerator. E4 Impact Foundation is a not-for-profit uh, not organization that was founded in Italy, but we have been in Kenya and Africa since 2010. And uh, the main objective of E4 Impact is to build and support a new crop of impact entrepreneurs across the region. Um, we also seek to create partnerships between Africa, the MENA region, and Europe. Um, and lastly, is also to work with um, universities across Africa 
to be the champions of entrepreneurship and more especially impact entrepreneurship. So those are the three goals that we aim to, to deliver as A4Impact. We have a portfolio of services that we offer. Um, one is the um, Impact uh, Entrepreneurship Program. It's an MBA program, which is our flagship program. We also offer short courses on entrepreneurship. We also have specialized and developed skills in value chain development. Um, and we have the entrepreneurship centers, which would be what we run as our incubators and accelerator. We currently have three of those in Kenya, in Cameroon, and in Egypt. And then finally, we also offer um, international services. We support donor agencies to implement um, different projects that are geared towards sustainability through entrepreneurship. Um, so as Eric has mentioned, together with the team, we are happy to be the accelerator that is implementing the OFAM program here in Kenya. And we started, we launched our call for applications at the beginning of the month, um, 10th of October. Um, I'm happy to say it has generated quite a bit of interest and the OFAM program here is offering, is looking to offer a customized program for the agribusiness in the secular space. Um, they would also be supported with technical assistance to sort of refine their innovations that they have. How can they be, make them more efficient? Um, with this, we'll, they'll also be accompanied with coaching just to ensure that the learnings that they are taking from the program are actually well implemented into their businesses. And they'll also be paired with uh, mentors, people in the similar space who have run successful businesses. How do they do it? You don't need to reinvent the wheel. How can they benefit from that expertise? We are also looking to create links, financial links. I think we all are familiar with the challenges that SMEs face. And you can imagine how, um, how much more difficult that is for SMEs in the agriculture space as a secular economy at that level. Um, so we want to create a bit of financial links and investment opportunities for this SME. Um, to support that, I think we've had Peter talking about some enterprises um, that are running different amazing innovations from Ethiopia. From the, um, so those are sort of the links that we also want to leverage on, create networking. How can we learn from those who've done something similar? So a lot of peer learning opportunities will come through in the program. And then we also have um, a seed grant that would be awarded to um, four entrepreneurs in the two cohorts. And this is an interesting way. It will be peer to peer awarded. So the cohort will be sort of validating their, their, their co-members to say, you know, we really feel that this enterprise deserves a bit of financial boost to get them to the next level, which I think is a bit different from what most of us are used to, you know, having the investors decide who would get this. And again, really just to create networking opportunities, I think it is clear and it has been mentioned during the, the scoping study that was done. Circular economy is still a very um, new space here, it's still immature. So these opportunities is to create and bring like-minded people to come together to champion for secular economy in, in agriculture. So as I mentioned, we have attracted over 130 applications, which is quite, quite impressive. And at the same time, it really shows you concretely the demand for um, programs that offer this kind of support. You have SMEs sometimes, you know, you're just put in one stream, not necessarily looking at your, at your solution, which is um, uh, in the circular economy. So this is a great need. And I hope, you know, as we pilot this program, it can actually grow because there's need for it. Um, so we are currently going through the selection process. And of this 130, they will be saved using different um, stages of saving um, to arrive at the cohort of 12 that will go through a six month program. Um, and they have actually a customized um, SME curriculum that has really been built with the collaboration of Pop Inc. and, and uh, Village Capital. And this will really looking at their businesses, all the components, where are you starting from? What do you want to achieve? Because it's really milestone based. What do you want to achieve through this program? If you have challenges with your team, your impact, how do we streamline that? So this curriculum is really to address this component um, of, of the business. Um, I, I think with that, um, and, and just to mention what I, I also think is, is very important and, and the approach that it has been taken to use um, ESOs, I think we you know with the hubs coming up and mushrooming and working together, it creates a great opportunity for all of us to, to sort of move a common agenda forward. So again, we're very happy as E4 Impact to, to be part of this discussion. 
Um, and I think I'll stop there. Uh, over to you, Eric. Uh, thank you so much, Isabella. I think it doesn't get any more granular than that. Um, but at this point, I would like to encourage us to return to a higher level. Um, so we're asking ourselves some very pertinent questions at this point. And I would encourage everyone in the room to reflect on this. So how can we make circular a good business, a mainstream approach? You know, what business opportunities do we need to see for circular agribusinesses in East Africa? And this could be all over Africa. So it's something that's really key. And we thought of three key opportunity questions that um, we can ask the stakeholders themselves uh, that are on the ground, that understand the local context, the local markets, and definitely have an idea of something that can be tailored their different ecosystems. But before we get there, um, I would like to mention that we are in the beginning of this program as highlighted earlier. So we also do not have all the answers yet. So, however, we are really curious and uh, that's why the ESOs are speaking to this. And that's why you, uh, the different stakeholders in the room are also very pertinent to answering some of these questions. So carrying on. Um, so um, just before I, I engage Beza uh, to answer about some of these, I'd like to encourage everyone in the room, you know, feel free to add your view uh, to this question in the chat. So Beza will speak to it and give us the context in Ethiopia, but would really love uh, everyone in the room to just share the ideas, share your thoughts, and we'll be engaging with you in chat in that regard. So at this point, um, I'd like to, uh, I invite you, Beza, you know, um, we're thinking about how might we create demand and markets for circular agri-food products in Ethiopia. Uh, Beza, wait. Thank you, Eric. Um, in my view, uh, the first and foremost step would be uh, to create a substantial amount of behavioral change, uh, a dynamic which would create uh, an awareness and uh, advocating at a level, not only at the high level, at policy level, but in, at individual consumer and, and producers level. What kind of behavioral change do we need to take? What kind of alternative choice do we need to adapt and lifestyles? Uh, what kind of understanding do we need to build in our, in our psychology that West is not only West, but it can be a, a wealth generating, income generating source? So that would be one of the things that would really be driving the demand itself uh, once the common understanding is developed. Uh, the second and most important thing, in my view, is uh, about the opportunity that uh, circular economy bring in the region to drive uh, innovation, entrepreneurship, job creation for the young graduates. Uh, obviously, the nine to five eleven job is uh, is now is no longer feasible to accommodate the large number of fresh graduates coming from the universities, and uh, the private sector is not yet mature enough to absorb them. If the public sector is not uh, willing to accept uh, to provide the job, so it is about finding that opportunity to create their jobs themselves. So that would be the second most important driving uh, key driving. Uh, motive for adopting trans, um, circularity in my view. Uh, the last, uh, the third important thing is obviously uh, the small and medium enterprise uh, market is uh, not uh, small. It is actually quite considerable when you, when you look at it at the bigger economy of the country. Uh, though they're still not financially uh, high capital level yet. Uh, but the market value they play is high. So uh, giving that opportunity or leveraging the opportunity they bring to the table about uh, how circular products and services can fit into the market value chain is uh, something that we could uh, really consider when it comes to creating demand for circularity, uh, especially when it comes to uh, the government's current initiative of uh, developing industry parks in different parts of the country. Uh, of course, the, 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 the raw material and input definitely comes from the peripheral within 100, 150 kilometers of the industry parks. But then making sure that that vertical integration system uh, kind of adapts circular uh, opportunities uh, could 
bring that demand for those uh, products and services. Uh, and obviously the competitiveness also comes into the picture. And then looking beyond at the larger scale, this could also fit into the regional and then of course the global market value chain itself. So this, these are the, the low hanging fruits that would actually be uh, in the, in, in the, as enablers to push the agenda of circular in Africa or in Ethiopia for, on, on, on immediate basis, I would say. Uh, thank you, Eric. I'll give you back the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Beza, uh, for sharing some of those thoughts. And definitely, I think uh, a number of pertinent insights uh, are to be picked. And just before we, uh, I, so from our landscaping studies, we also saw a few opportunities that I would just like to uh, put out it out there just to get the ball rolling, to get um, us thinking more along this direction. And as you can, and so just before I go there, uh, just a food for thought to everyone in the room. You know, how can you contribute to this opportunity? Um, what do you see that, or what unique value do you see that you are, you have, or you're well positioned to produce and to bring uh, to? To this opportunity of creating demand and markets for circular agri-food products. As we've seen, it's quite something that is key and necessary. So we appreciate all those comments coming through and all those ideas. Um, thank you so much. So just from our landscaping study, I think Beza alluded to this, that behavioral change, it's something critical. And you know, just changing that perception of, you know, it's not really waste, but it's now food. Um, it's not really the maize stock anymore. It's now something edible. So, and another one is uh, having favorable government policies. Um, so this can include uh, product certifications or even uh, some market protection. So um, another one that we saw is something that can uh, contribute to this is reducing inefficiencies generally um, across the collection of food losses and byproducts and we've seen some innovation not just in South Africa but across Sub-Saharan Africa to this regard and it has been able to create uh, some really good opportunities and a, a one that's and I, that's a thought but also, also more of in a question you know how do we integrate circular agribusinesses and value chains of large FMCG companies and uh, they have the market traction and market confidence so the endorsing of some of these products um, is something that will be well received in the market. So it's something we think is a, a good opportunity. So um, just carrying on to the next uh, opportunity that we see, um, uh, that uh, how might we provide access to circular technologies, uh, expertise, and networks in Uganda. And so it's a Uganda context and definitely would encourage the team once again, keep sharing uh, any insights you have to this regard. And I'll definitely be speaking more about this later on. But at the moment, uh, let me invite Barbara to give us uh, the Ugandan context in this. Um, thank you so much, Eric. Um, for us to be able to create awareness, one of the things that um, we need to look at is for us to be able to bring access to these technologies and for people to get uh, more awareness, we need to create accelerator programs. So I feel like this, first of all, the first point is this accelerator would be an excellent way for us to be able to provide these technologies, expertise, and also to create networks in Uganda that would support entrepreneurs to be able to build and scale up uh, innovations around this. Um, it's quite new. We don't have any accelerators in the past that have done this before. And also when you look at the number of entrepreneurs that are actually thinking about this, they're very few. So for us to be able to do this, the accelerator is an excellent, excellent point of view. And looking at Uganda's ecosystem right now, we have a, a number of ESOs that have been coming up and we've created um, a network called Startup Uganda. So one of the ways that we can ensure that um, startups or entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs have access to these technologies is through leveraging this network. The collaboration that is already existing between the hubs would be a good way to ensure that regardless of where a startup or um, a business is based, 
they can get access to the expertise, the technologies, and also a network. And also leverage, leveraging the African network, AfriLabs, uh, which um, Hive Collab is actually a co-founder um, of AfriLabs Network. It's a good way to not only take it into East Africa, but also now onto the um, African continent so that uh, young people can start building around uh, the circular economy and also knowing what technologies and leveraging um, technologies that are existing elsewhere. So if it, if it is successful in Italy, it has already gained traction. There's a lot of lessons that we could bring onto here and localize them so that it also works for the East African um, for the East African community. And so I feel it's about partnerships and collaboration with those who are just starting out and us, uh, sorry, us who are starting out and those who have already been there, uh, the collaborations between the communities themselves within the very country, um, that even if Hive Collab is the hub that has been selected to work on this, we should be working with all the other hubs to see how can they also encourage entrepreneurs within their networks to access and leverage the technologies that are being provided, the expertise, and also creating a network around it, an East African network around uh, circular technology, because this would also help in leveraging more funds coming in and also entrepreneurs learning from each other. If the Kenyan guys have already done this and there's a step ahead, they, they can be able to transfer that knowledge um, and lessons and even their failures to the Ugandan counterparts and the Ethiopian counterparts so that we can learn from each other and not make the same mistakes and also grow it um, across the board. Thank you. Wow, thank you so much, uh, Barbara. I think that uh, is as contextual as it can get. I'm definitely looking forward to further conversation around that. So our food for thought around uh, second opportunity is, you know, how can your platform or your network or your organization support the acceleration of circular agribusiness in East Africa and beyond? So that's something that you can reflect on. And uh, definitely, I believe there are ideas and thoughts that you can plug in and you can see yourself contributing to us growing this in East Africa and beyond. So some, some ideas we got from the landscaping study um, include more accelerators, right? Exactly what Barbara just said and increasing the awareness. Um, and another one that will be pertinent is not just transferring these, some of these global technologies to the East African context. Now there are, can be a number of challenges to this finance and among them, and definitely one of the questions you're asking later on. And but it's something that we think is key. And then, what's the role of research institutions? Because innovation itself is born out of research. So, how key are they to driving such an agenda um, and transforming the livelihoods across the continent? And then, lastly, was how do we explore cost reductions? And so, can this be through the use of technology? or even localizing some of the uh, innovations uh, to be able to maximize uh, 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 economies of scale uh, to that regard. So these are some of the thoughts around this and we are definitely uh, appreciating a lot of the thoughts coming through uh, on, the ch on the chat. And um, as we go on into the third opportunity and I, I alluded to it earlier on that finance is key and Definitely it's been a bit of a, a hindrance uh, to a wide, wide scale adoption of this. So we thought to understand from the Kenyan context, um, how might we finance the growth of circular agri-food SMEs in Kenya and who better than, the, than Isabella from IFO Impact to give us uh, some of these insights. So you're welcome, Isabella. Thanks, thanks Eric. Um, I, I think financing for SMEs um, in Kenya, really, it's still a challenge. Um, as I said, again, if you bring it even to the context of um, uh, circular economy, especially in food, it becomes even more challenging. Um, so I, in my opinion, I think one of the biggest challenges we've seen our SMEs grappling with is, you know, accessing working capital. In working capital for most investors is like a black hole. You know, you keep putting money, but you're not seeing anything much. So they tend to, to shy away. So if um, we had more opportunities um, that could advance or give avail this funds for SMEs, I think it's possible for them to you know, grow their businesses organically to get themselves to the level that now you can start conversing with an investor for you know, initial rounds of, of financing. Um, the other thing we see, uh, we're struggling also in, in, in Kenya is um, credit facilities for mainstream um, institutions in the, in the finance space. So if you are to approach them for um, debt, 
uh, that sometimes it's just outright no, or if you know, you say, okay, maybe those terms are very, very stringent, you know, they wouldn't look that you're in a space that is different from mainstream commercial um, enterprises. So that's one of the challenges. So if we had um, a way of improving the credit infrastructure, that would be very, very helpful. Um, and finally, just looking at innovative um, SME financing opportunities. Um, one of these could be, um, you know, what I've seen coming up, uh, e-lending platforms that do not necessarily use the traditional documents for an SME to ascertain or say your, your, you know, your credit worthy at this point. So they'd probably look at e-invoicing, they would look at your transactional history and say, okay, at this level, you actually qualify to, to get this amount of money. Um, and one good example of this is, is Avenues. They've done um, using uh, credit history, no, transactional history of an enterprise to advance working capital. So that's a win-win. You're able to really sort of start even formalizing and putting your structures in place, but you have access to, to finance. And, and, and what we've seen happening here, when you have somebody who steps into that gap, then also the financial institutions can be persuaded to come in because at that level, you have somebody else who's almost shouldering the risk with you. So that's, that's quite interesting. Um, we have other people like Farm Drive who do the work of getting the SMEs together, especially the, the micro SMEs, and sort of trying to put all their data in a place that they can be able to um, qualify and say, okay, this is your credit score. And if you were to go to a, an MFI, you can be able to get a, um, a certain amount of money. So when you have somebody who steps into that gap, then it's possible to start now linking to this other uh, mainstream financing um, avenues. So I, I think this could be more interesting. Of course, at the end of it all, we are interested to start attracting more investment, both locally, regionally, and internationally at that level. And also uh, to try to match, you know, have investors that would understand the context of where these SMEs are operating, um, and what it takes for them to get to the next level. So, you know, sometimes they need smaller ticket sizes than what you're used to, uh, used to. So I think a bit of flexibility or investors who would be able to be willing to go down and be a bit more patient would be very helpful for SMEs. Thanks, thanks, Eric. Thank you so much, Isabella. I think that gives us a really good understanding um, of some of the challenges that are being faced in the Kenyan ecosystem. So similarly, we're asking ourselves, you know, how can you contribute to this opportunity? How can you contribute to the plugging of the various uh, SME financing gaps, especially in the uh, agriculture and agri-food agri sector um, that is predominantly thought of as extremely high risk? So um, one of the thoughts uh, we had from our studies and definitely tying in with what Isabella has just shared is you know a need for tailored financial uh, services you know and we're thinking uh, we could have blended finance um, probably a mix of debt equity um, including grants and or even results based financing so that's uh, those are some of the thoughts that could help uh, buttress some of the issues that uh, a lot of the the microfinance and the larger organizations face with funding um, agri-food and uh, agri-circularity SMEs. And another one could be how might we convince uh, impact investors to invest in circular agribusiness? Because as you've seen, there is no doubting the impact potential of the circular economy. That question is, you know, how do we get them to see that there is also a financial benefit to it, not just um, a, a lot of transformation opportunities? And another one is um, how to integrate circular agribusinesses uh, in donor financing, donor and uh, financing programs. So talking about their needs and potential actions. So basically matching uh, this agri-circularity and circular economy vision to the visions of a lot of the donors, uh, because at the end of the day, we're all targeting the same thing. We want transformation across our economies and we want better livelihoods and uh, uh, agri-circularity hits uh, those two right on the sweet spot. So at this point, um, I, we've had a lot, we've shared a lot, and I'm just going to invite Peter, uh, and just before I do that, I'd like to thank uh, Isabella Bezoit and um, Barbara for sharing a, a lot of that context. And I'll just invite Peter to synthesize all the information that we've learned and that we've shared in this session. 
uh, just in a deep conversation objective. Over to you, Peter. Um, thank you so much, Eric. And once again, Isabella, Rezoid, well done. Barbara, well done, well done, fantastic. Well done in terms of setting the tone. And just to bring it together, um, all firms basically aims to, you know, make a clarity a mainstream approach in um, the East African agri-food sector uh, by 2025. And uh, we can't do this alone. Uh, we realize that this is an ambitious vision and we need to work together to realize this. And uh, it's important for us to exchange ideas. Um, the, the, the whole, the previous session basically hinted on some of the perspectives from the enterprise support organizations. And I think it's important for us to move a bit deeper and also open it up to the audience um, to show that at least you can extract as much as possible your views to help us really move this movement uh, forward. So the next session is basically a breakout group. Um, we're going to split you up into three groups, uh, Kenya, Ethiopia, and uh, Uganda. And this, again, is uh, going to be facilitated by my colleagues, uh, Emil, Emil uh, Gawin, Rold will be facilitating the breakout groups. We have divided you into three groups uh, based on your preferences, uh, which you hinted earlier, which is uh, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia. I will be joining the Kenyan group. Um, Eric will be joining the Uganda group. And the ESOs from the respective countries will also align themselves with the different groups. So at this stage, I'd like to request uh, Shereen just to open up this, this group session so that you can be able to dig a deep deeper into the conversation and, uh, and get your, your views into this process. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. This is Hermin from uh, Pop Inc. speaking, one of the uh, implementers of the OFARMS program. I'm just checking whether there's already a facilitator for this uh, group. Otherwise, I'll be happy to take the lead. Guess that's a no. So then, um, Isabella, I see you have joined as well. Um, if you could kindly join me and, and facilitate this uh, breakout uh, discussion, that'd be great. Um, so I think we're all in the in the Kenya group, uh, focusing our discussions on how to um, address these uh, three opportunities within the Kenyan context. Um, maybe before we uh, we start, it might be nice to do a quick uh, intro round. And um, if you're comfortable with that, you can unmute and um, say uh, your name and uh, the organization you work for. And otherwise, you can leave it in a chat just to uh, so everyone knows who we have in the room. Yeah, um, I'll start. My name is George Murage. I work with IntelliCup and SunCup. Uh, and we are a consulting organization. And we also work with a lot of enterprises to do upskilling um, and you know, enterprise support for them. Uh, yeah, happy to be here and learn about how we can improve circularity in the Kenyan context. Thanks, George. Wants to go next. Should I jump in then? Um, so I'm Kirsten, I'm from Bob Inc. And I think, uh, so my background is communications at the team. I think for everyone within our team, we're super excited about this project and really, yeah, really enthusiastic to see what can come out of it, including today. So yeah, nice to meet everyone. Yeah, uh, hi everyone. My name is Daniel Kito. I'm based out of Nairobi with the IntelliCup team. I'm a manager within the energy, climate change, and agriculture practice. So, yeah, really looking at uh, the whole Eastern, Southern African region. Thank you. Okay, maybe I can go next. I, we had a slight pass, so I just I had dropped off. Uh, my name is Makana Odongo. I'm with Vil Village Capital and I have really enjoyed working on this all farms program. I think it's very interesting. And I also want to see how it can pan out in the grand, in the bigger context of things, especially in East Africa, where we are piloting this. And I'm happy to be here. I think we're almost halfway. Um, hi, I can go next. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't turn my video on. I'm having some bandwidth issues today. That's okay. But hi, I'm Tanvi Deshpande. I work at IntelliCap with George and Daniel. Uh, I'm also working on a couple of agriculture and climate change projects at the moment. Uh, and we're really looking to build a practice around regenerative agriculture here at IntelliCap. And uh, I'm interested in seeing how we can maybe get some learnings from East Africa into India as well. And uh, uh, also at what the role technology can play in doing that. So. Happy to be here. Thank you. 
Fantastic. For those that haven't spoken yet, this is your last chance. Uh, so I mentioned you can also leave your intro uh, in the chat. Um, because then, because uh, of time, we'll get started uh, with the discussion. I was hoping to share my screen, but uh, apparently I don't have the permission. I'm not a host, so um, yeah, maybe Daniel, first, if you could help. Um, yeah, I think Daniel can do that. Yeah, so Daniel, if you want to make yeah. uh, both Christian yeah, and uh, Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot, George. Yeah. Thanks, Daniel. All right, but uh, while we wait, um, so we'll go over these uh, three uh, questions one by one, hoping you can build uh, on what's already been shared by the, the panelists in the, in the uh, plenary presentation. Um, so yeah, I see I have screen sharing permission now. So there you go. Um, so starting with the, the first question, um, you heard some initial thoughts on um, on the challenges we might need to overcome to create markets for uh, circular agri-food uh, products um, and really taking a, a consumer-centric approach to that. Um, we've put the IDs in the in the stickies from the uh, from the panelists, but as you see, there are some stickies still empty. So we were hoping you can uh, share some other thoughts about how we can uh, approach this uh, this challenge or opportunity. Any other thoughts or builds on what has been shared already? Again, you can either speak up or you can leave it in the chat, whatever you're most comfortable with. Um, maybe instead of getting uh, getting ready, Gavin, I, I thought um, in the chat when we were in the main session it was yeah. quite interesting what came out in the, in the chat. Um, mm. The idea that um, for circular economy, um, in as much as there's a push from the supply side, there's also need for demand to be um, strengthened. You know, I, I don't know. So if you want to sort of still capture that and the behavioral change as a, an, an add-on point. But I think the idea that it needs to also come from the market. So what does it take for the market to be educated to know that, you know, it would be important to consider, you know, sourcing for uh, products for, that have come through the, the circular economy as opposed to, you know, linear um, produced products. So I, I think there's also a bit of education that needs to go there and, and, and you know, trying to sort of start looking and create that demand locally before mm. we can say we want to get out of our region. I think we need to feed ourselves as Africans first before we can think of the, of the larger market. That, that yeah. for me was quite, quite interesting. Yeah. Thanks for, uh, for reiterating that, uh, that suggestion from the plenary session, uh, Isabella. Um, could you bring this to life with maybe some examples? Like, have you seen any strong consumer education or behavioral change campaigns around this topic? Or would you say this is very new to the Kenyan market? Maybe in other sectors or? Um, so actually, let me use one that we visited at the beginning of um, the O-Farms program. Um, so they're called Safi Organic. They use um, the waste from the rice, the rice husk. So, you know, after you're done with harvesting your rice, you remain with the stocks and there's nothing much that is done. Most people would burn that up. But they managed to turn that into an organic fertilizer, right? And they um, infuse it with a bit of um, minerals that are required, some nutrients for the for, for plants. And it has done very well in where we, so we visited actually a farmer who started using and he said he used it fast because he saw a farmer who had used it and he had seen, you know, the productivity had, in, had increased. Mm. So sometimes it's also an issue of um, using um, or benchmarking with who you would consider to be a lead in your space. Um, so is it possible to work with this um, champion entrepreneurs or uh, champion farmers to say, you know, can we partner on this? 
I think the minute they see the, the value and, and really the, the transition from where they were before to this new space, they are probably, if they've improved their productivity, that translates to, you know, better income. So it's very tangible, you know, it's not somebody coming to tell you it's important. So that has created a demand for their fertilizer. Okay, so th those kind of examples are what I think would be useful to you and, and to educate people to say, okay, it's good that there's this other fertilizer, but you know, if you use this, there's almost a guarantee. And he was saying, I think there was 30% um, uh, increment in, in, in the production. Um, try it. It's also good for the environment. It's utilizing what you would have burnt to come back. So I, yep. I think with education and, and concrete value that is tangible to the farmer, it is possible to start moving. Yeah. Thanks for that example, Isabella. And um, if others want to respond to this, I'm, I'm particularly keen to understand whether um, circularity should become an explicit part of uh, marketing uh, messaging. Uh, referring to the uh, the tomato ketchup example that was presented in a linear in the plenary session, I think in in certain uh, countries or markets there's definitely a demand uh, among consumers for for fair products or products that reduce the environmental footprint. Um, where mentioning that the the product is made from uh, tomatoes that other, would otherwise be uh, lost makes a lot of sense, but in markets where consumers are not so conscious about that or don't maybe bother uh, that much about it um would there be an angle you'd bring into marketing uh messaging or is it just another ketchup in this case and you wouldn't even want to mention it yeah, i'd be interested in the answer to that question right like it's really i mean i think in our other session we spoke about um using youth more in a way as another sort of access point with women. But I'd also be interested in, in that angle for circularity and maybe their interest to take on products that they know or do not know have that background. I'd, I'd be really interested to sort of look at that as well. I think, uh, and I'll, I'll maybe just jump in here. I think I think something that's increasingly more uh, coming out a little more is, is the whole traceability aspect. So. You know, for example, being able to trace um, where your ketchup in this case maybe would be coming from and kind of ensuring that the farmer that, uh, you know, grew the, those tomatoes, for example, is actually getting fairly compensated. Mm -hmm. And if I had information that, for example, you know, maybe the, the there's, a, there's a concept my colleague and I were discussing today around ugly tomatoes and good looking tomatoes. So I think advertising has played a big part towards, you know, and, um, Ideally, food waste. So, in the in the supermarket, if you if you go in, you are more likely to pick a tomato that is well rounded, has no marks. But I think if if we could maybe, you know, skew the messaging more towards, um, you know, you have these ones that look nice, and you have the others that maybe don't look so nice, but you know, have been grown in a more sustainable way. Uh, there's a le lot less food waste. I think that would actually drive people to want to use that product more. I think I think consumer education. And I think if you sensitize people that this is actually good for the planet, I think people are more likely to actually want to take that um, or, or um, you know, consume that product if it's actually making, has an impact on the world. And I think that the reason that I think that- Fantastic, thanks, George. Um, we could either stay with the consumer demand perspective or we can look at the other uh, elements with regards to creating markets for circular agri-food products you know, building on. Um, by the way, there's some noise on the line, so anyone could mute. Great. Um, so there are a couple of more angles that we can bring in. Um, so integrating circularity agribusiness into value change of larger FMCG companies. So what role can they play to mainstream these circular products? Um, the, the policy uh, discussion we had briefly, um, and then uh, reducing inefficiencies in the collection of food losses and, and by products. I mean, often these supply chains are not organized yet or not as nicely organized as um, the, 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 the commodities or the, the final products that already have markets. Um, any reflections on, on these points? Or again, if you have completely different perspective, perspective you'd like to bring in with regards to this question, go ahead. 
Um, I, I, I think there are things, uh, Darwin, uh, for me that would be important and could also contribute to creating the demand is, um, you know, if you look at um, the people, the current consumers who have the buying power, you know, they're almost used to a certain way of shopping, a certain way of consuming. So is it possible to go a little lower to start targeting the youth, the people who are preparing to be the future clients, you know? Uh, at that level, you're already instilling and helping them to understand, you know, if you're buying um, a product that was sustainably um, produced or after the production period says um, this product has been made from recycling or upcycling, then it's something that you're already starting to create that mindset um, that, you know, it would be important. And I think even looking at how millennials have had an impact on how they consume things, um, it's really created a demand for some businesses. So I think that could also be another way. Can we start a bit earlier to educate um, the, the populations in, 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 in schools, in the universities to start thinking about this? Because it, you know, when you arrive at the time where you have the ability to purchase, you would probably shift with what you've known in the household that you've grown. So I think it could be important to go down. And, and you see some of these schools now trying to do um, with the new curriculum that we have in Kenya, for instance, children are being taught how to grow their own food. You know, how do you use the, 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 the manure that comes from the rabbit back to your little patch of, of lettuce or, veg, or spumawiki. So that already is a start, and, and I think it could be important. So those guys would be able to know you can produce your own food, or if you're purchasing, it's food that you want produced in a certain way. So already you're sensitive to, to, to um, the circularity and, the, and its importance for yourself, for your health, and for the planet. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Any other uh, thoughts? So otherwise, I uh, suggest we move to the next uh, question. Um, I'm hoping to hear from some others in this uh, call. I saw in a, in a message um, uh, um, a question about a black soldier fly larvae um, that are cultivated on, on food waste or agricultural waste. Um, which might, of course, lead to certain consumer perception. I mean, it's not the the the, the nicest sight uh, or thought. Uh, these larvae and then being converted into into products that enter uh, value change, maybe not directly for human consumption, but for animal feed, maybe. Um, Proskovia, if you could touch on the consumer perspective uh, perception uh, aspect about this, that would be uh, great. Talking from your own experience. Has that been a barrier for markets? Go ahead. Yeah, so at the moment, uh, people have embraced the use of them as animal feed, but not really as uh, human food. So when, they, when they're thinking about using it as a stock animal feed or eat animal protein, they don't have an issue. But when they're thinking about uh, consuming it as a snack or maybe integrating it into their, their own food consumption. That's when uh, there is a lot of resistance. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Poskovia. I couldn't fully hear what you were saying, but um, it sounds like when um, when using black soldier fly production for uh, production of um, uh, products for human consumption, there might be some challenges. I think this also has to do with the certification of these kind of products based on how how safe and hygienic they uh, they are. So definitely something to discuss more uh, about that. Um, Great, if there are no further thoughts, uh, then we'll move to the next uh, question and see if that sparks some more um, a conversation. Um, so the next uh, business opportunity is all about providing uh, entrepreneurs in Kenya with um, access to the uh, right uh, technologies that they need to process food losses and byproducts into sellable products, but also access to expertise and, uh, and network uh, to, uh, to grow their business. Any uh, thoughts on uh, on this? Yeah, um, 
happy to jump in. I think um, just looking at the Kenyan context, uh, you know, you, you could sort of divide entrepreneurs into sort of the big players, um, you know, that, that could be even the likes of manufacturers. And then you could have um, the, the smaller guys who possibly could be uh, part of the supply chain to the to the large players and also maybe now uh, you know possibly others who are more in the retail so um, I think on on issues of technology I'm, I'm thinking possibly you know uh, those who are more closer to the the, the built or the production space uh, you know because they're the ones in, in charge of creating products uh, and then possibly looking at um, aspects of, uh, you know, how, how to merge policy. Um, for instance, like for instance, in Kenya, you have recently the, uh, the extended producer regulations uh, with respect to having, you know, sort of enforcing a culture of um, circularity within the manufacturing space where, you know, potentially producers paying for, you know, whatever pollution they sort of, or emittance they, they release from, from products. So that sort of loop in terms of those manufacturers together with their supply chain, working concurrently, um, you know, um, to build products or technologies that answer to the circularity call. So, um, so I think there could be some level of delineation in terms of, um, where where the enterprises fit. So if 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 the larger players more are more into products, um, then their role could be you know you know on the R and D side, uh, you know answering to that policy call. Uh, for their supply, the smaller suppliers maybe it's more of a, from an adoption point of view. Um, and, and again, they take the cue from the large players. Similarly to what we saw when you know for example uh, the plastic ban came into effect. So I'm looking at. Uh, you know, maybe also taking another step at for the enterprises, uh, you know, maybe filtering through what would be the ideal fit and what role would they play um, in, in terms of technology, uh, but again, Great. also aligning to policy. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. And as you were talking, we moved back to the plenary session. So you had a much larger audience uh, when sharing this great thought. Um, uh, over to uh, the main facilitators of this session. Yeah. Thanks so much, Gawain. And we must apologize. But the term was really quite short, and we generated quite a lot of buzz and discussions with the different groups, and we had to tap into yours. Um, we have about 10 minutes to close the session, and I thought it's nice just to have maybe one round of feedback from, from for example, Ethiopia. Could you just listen into Ethiopia? Just give us what are the two insights that came out from your discussion? Ethiopia. Yes, thank you very much. So actually, we combined Ethiopia and Uganda here. So if you can go to yeah. So the first one about demand and markets, we had a very interesting discussion um, around behavior change. And how can we make sure that circular food products fit in existing uh, behavior and existing food products? Um, making sure to mimic what's already out there. Uh, to make it less of a big change for people. Because there are a lot of cultural aspects, um, for example, Soil and more shared that with the black soldier fly, they had a hard time uh, starting it in Ethiopia. Um, and then secondly, um, uh, Hive Collab and Bob Inc. were suggesting that we should uh, leverage trust that consumers already have. So leverage trusted brands like big uh, companies, big FMCG companies, uh, to make sure that uh, consumers trust this circular product that has been made from waste and also to smoothen that, uh, that transition to them uh, consuming circular products. All right, and for the second part, we combined uh, finance and network. So we spoke a lot about technology transfer, very interesting. Uh, Bezawit from XHub made a strong point about that it's hard to, uh, to uh, suddenly import technology into Ethiopia because actually you need quite a strong energy supply. You have high operational costs. She has seen that problem occur before with solar irrigation pumps. They are hard to maintain. So how can we make sure that global technologies will really fit into the local context of Ethiopia to start circular production? 
And Eric from Village Capital also made a strong point about that we need a coherent ecosystem approach. So we need to have tailored financial services for SMEs that want to experiment with new circular concepts. And we need to reduce the risk for, uh, for SMEs to step into this combined with acceleration programs like OFARMS. So that was it from the Ethiopia Uganda part. Thank you all for that brief highlight about what came through in Ethiopia and, uh, and Uganda discussion. Um, in Kenya, we had two groups. Uh, the first one was facilitated by Gawin. Gawin, do you have one or two points you want to share from your discussion? Actually, just uh, one point, and you already heard, uh, heard Daniel talk about this. <laughs> so we spent uh, quite a lot of time on the, on the first uh, point. Oh, okay, I see we can also address that one. In that case, I'd like to ask Isabella and maybe to summarize what has been discussed. Uh, Isabella, so, the floor is yours. Yeah. Oh, great. Isabella was in my team. Yeah. Oh, super. Um, yes. So I, I think um, we were also discussing the points that came across quite strongly from the chat in the previous conversation um, to ensure that we support. In as much as you're supporting the supply side, we need to sort of push also and, and create awareness around the market so that there's equal um, push and pull factor there. Um, then we also discussed about, um, you know, if we are talking about the current consumers now, so there's a way in which we are already thinking how we're already behaving. So to sort of start creating a new crop of um, consumers who are more aware of, of circularity, the importance of, you know, purchasing uh, product, uh, products or produce that have been sustainably produced or they are, you know, recycled and upcycled, it might be important to go back to, to the basis. And we were even um, citing the CBC um, curriculum in Kenya where you have young ones planting their own food, they understand how you know, a farm is integrated. Those are good, good examples. So these are people who would grow up understanding the importance of you know, going green, um, buying, or if you're buying, if you're producing your own food, it needs to be done in a certain manner. If you're buying, then you'd want your food, you'd want to buy your food uh, from a place that you, you, know, you understand and you, you, you apply those principles to your own consumption. Um, I think we also talked about um, some examples of what is happening in Kenya in, in terms of using, um, I think it's also the points that Roll has mentioned, um, leveraging on some of the, um, for us, we looked at it at the, at, at the very basic level, farmers who are considered to be champion farmers or champion SMEs. So if, for example, you have your organic fertilizer, could you partner with a lead farmer in your area? Because, you know, we would always want to see what the leader is doing and try to see how we can adapt the same to our context. So that's one of the ways that we thought could be interesting in, in that regard. I hope I haven't left anything else. I guess there was a point about a challenge, you know, using the BSF, the Black Soja Fly. I think it's, it's gaining acceptance, um, particularly with the, with the, for animal feed. Um, but also, I think it's possible to consume it as human, right? It can be consumed. But I think there's also the challenge of accepting what kind of standardization does it need to go through before we can say, OK, this is ready for consumption. So there's still that bit of a gap right there. Thank you so much, Isabella, for those insights from your group. Really appreciate it. I think some of the notes may have captured across uh, the discussion. So uh, the second group from Kenya, um, Emil, you'll forgive me, I won't give an audience to speak, um, maybe next time. <laughs> so for us to wrap this up, really, is uh, to see how we can be able to move uh, uh, the, the whole conversation around circularity forward. And uh, basically, for us as orphans, what we see uh, as, as, as key, key takeaways and what we think also will be key takeaways for you is circular business, what does it mean to us really? So we see it, it means, it means uh, reusing food losses um, and byproducts to make human foods, animal feeds, biodegradable uh, packaging material, compost and energy for agricultural value chains. Um, and Offarms as an accelerator, we hope to support 40 circular agribusinesses in East Africa, Kenya, Uganda, and Ethiopia uh, to scale up uh, from 2021 to 2023. And we see three key business opportunities that we have discussed together that we think would be a key stepping stone uh, for us to move forward. So one is how do we create market and demand for circular products? How do we provide access to technology, expertise, and networks that people can leverage on, entrepreneurs can leverage on to drive the circularity forward? And the third one is providing access to finance. At this stage, we would like you to think about what your role can be in realizing making circularity business a mainstream approach in East Africa. 
And uh, for those who are already energized um, in terms of, uh, and they're curious to learn more about circular business and all farms, as Eric mentioned, we have done some landscaping studies. So please check out our brand new Ethiopian landscaping study in the, in the download section of all farms. Uh, and this can be accessed on the Brella platform. And at this stage, I'd like to give um, uh, an audience to, to my colleague, uh, Sherwin, to run a, a quick poll. But before we do that, it's just to send a quick thank you for all of you to join for joining our session. And you can reach out to us and find us on Brella, uh, where we can be able to network and take this conversation forward. And uh, before we close, we have about three minutes. I'd like to give um, um, Emil maybe two minutes just to say a quick thank you um, to the audience. And then we close it with the, with the poll. Emil, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Peter. Yeah, I was just I was just adding the two takeouts from our breakout group, which uh, I, I thought was very uh, interesting. We had a, a very good blend of people with a investment background, practitioners on the ground, and and, and also entrepreneur support organizations. Um, so I, I captured the two key things: one, on access to technology, finding a sweet spot between the local frugal Juwakali kind of technologies that that might break down a bit sooner, but have a lot of potential versus the really expensive uh, 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 technology being shipped in, uh, which is often too costly. And the second key point was how can we support those research organizations where a lot of new ideas are also actually originate from, like the insects I, I understood from Elton, but how do we support them with more commercial approaches? So that's what I wanted to share from our group. And then uh, just a, a huge big thanks to the entire team that made this, uh, made this session possible. Uh, you, Peter, but also the rest of the team from Village Capital, Bob Inc. and the ESOs. So thanks a lot and wish you all a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Emil. So please, there's a poll that is running currently. Uh, please feel free to type it in and respond to this poll. And uh, with that, we'd like to really appreciate your, your time and audience. And uh, thank you so much for the contributions. We'll make a small write-up about the discussions. And we hope that you'll follow all farms as we continue to promote circular agribusiness in East Africa and we drive this program forward. Thank you so much and have a nice day. Thank you.